Let's pray now as we go to God's Word today. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all the assembled hearts be acceptable in your sight, Lord God, our Rock and our Redeemer. Open our ears, our hearts, our minds to your Word today that we might be encouraged because you provide for all of our needs of body and soul. In Jesus' name, amen. We're familiar with this word, empty. We don't very much like to experience things being empty, like our gas tank. We wish that it could stay just full all the time, right? Or our pockets full of money, that would be nice also to have an endless supply. And the batteries on these phones, why can't they just stay perpetually charged and never go empty? And there are other things that we might talk about, too, that are empty, that are troublesome, you know, and create a crisis in their own way. Time is another commodity, right? We wish time wasn't running out, wish we had more time, but we know that the sands in the hourglass, uh, they're they're, uh, uh, dropping right through there day by day, month by month, year by year, and we're moving toward a day. The Bible talks about it. The end, it's called, uh, the parousia, a fancier word, eschatology, the study of such things, you know. The end of the church year, as we are getting to it now, uh, before Advent starts again in a new church year, uh, the talk will be, the Scriptures will be about Jesus coming back, the end of time. We recognize that that is a limited commodity as well, this thing called time. We want to look at the background, uh, a setup really, to this story that you just heard. We need to go to 1 Kings chapter 16 right at the end uh, to really get a sense of what's going on. We have uh, these two folks wreaking havoc in the northern uh, kingdom of Israel in those days, somewhere around 850 B.C. This is Ahab who then married Jezebel. She wasn't an Israelite. She wasn't a Hebrew. She came from Phoenicia. Uh, this, uh, this Israelite king married her and uh, brought much trouble, really, uh, on the land and on the people of God. And, uh, and stirred up uh, plenty of anger in the one true God, too, with what she promoted, Baal worship, right? And uh, the female consort of Baal, Asherah, poles actually set up in, in uh, sacred um, Hebrew worship places uh, for the worship of false gods. And you can appreciate that God, as He said, is a jealous uh, God. He will... Uh, Uh, put that commandment uh, first and foremost uh, forward through Moses to his people, you shall have no other gods before me, uh, that first and great commandment. Well, Elijah the prophet is in view here, a very prominent Old Testament prophet, uh, so prominent, in fact, at the time of Christ, the people of God were wondering uh, if John the Baptist might be Elijah back, or even Jesus himself, such was Elijah in their, in their minds and in their hearts and in their history. Well, this is Elijah doing his prophetic work. He speaks a word of prophecy to Ahab, this wicked king, uh, that uh, as uh, as, uh, uh, discipline and punishment from God for all of the idolatry, he would withhold rain. It would not rain for a period of time, an extended period of time. There would be a drought, and with the drought, of course, always comes famine. But God would provide for his servant Elijah. He sent him in hiding to the Kareth ravine in order to be taken care of. And God took care of him with ravens, feeding him day by day. These aren't just nice Sunday school stories. These aren't parables. This is the living God providing out of his creation to his servants, the prophets in those days. Now, Kareth uh, Brook, you see in the lower right, the Kareth Ravine in that vicinity there, east of the Jordan River, south uh, east of the Sea of Galilee. And then you notice the name of a town there, Tishba. That's about all we know about Elijah, that he came from this town, and we think it's in that vicinity there. 
Well, God sends him to the Kareth Ravine to take care of him with the ravens coming, bringing him food. But then it was time to move on. God sent him way to the north, really outside the boundaries of northern Israel into the Phoenician territory where Jezebel had come, interestingly enough. The vicinities of Tyre and Sidon. You remember Jesus in his ministry went up that way uh, too for a visit. Now it's Elijah's uh, turn here in our story to go visit this widow at Zarephath right there on the sea. He arrives in town, as we heard in that story, and finds this woman picking up sticks and engages her in conversation. And like Jesus asked the woman at the well of Samaria for water, so also Elijah asked this widow woman for water that he might have a drink. Well, that was fine. She's happy to comply. But then he asks her uh, to go make him uh, a cake of bread that he might eat. And that's where it got a little uh, interesting there. Uh, It's there that she uh, pushed back a bit out of her own scarcity, out of her own circumstances. She said, as surely as uh, the Lord your God lives, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. I am gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. Can you imagine being in that kind of a circumstance where this is your last meal, it's all you have, no other means for providing for yourself, husband is gone, resources are depleted, a famine in the land, and that's where you end up. It's a sad account, a sad story. She was being honest with Elijah the prophet. When the cupboard is bare, uh, it's a difficult place to be. Maybe you've been there in your life one way or the other with a bare cupboard or uh, running on empty in one way or another. There's this other story that uh, comes up in the New Testament about a widow, another widow, and it has to do with... um, Uh, scarcity, right? It's a widow who's at the temple who's offering her uh, gift there at the temple, her offering that she is placing there, these two small copper coins, the widow's might, the story is uh, is referred to in the King James Version, Uh, these uh, pennies, like pennies, hardly worth anything, but yet she puts them in the offering plate, and that's all she has. And we might look at that and we say, well, that doesn't amount to much. Why did she even bother coming with such a meager offering? It's just a drop in the ocean. Maybe this is a foolish woman who doesn't know enough to keep what she has so that she can eat for another day. What difference would that make? Just such a tiny little offering like that, we might logically ask. But there's more there. There's more in that story. Jesus highlighted her offering as compared to the wealthy who were putting in a lot of money because she gave all she had. And that was an offering acceptable to the Lord, highlighted by Jesus. The last meal of this widow woman in Zarephath, down to her last penny, this woman in Jerusalem giving her offering Certainly God can understand what scarcity is like. God understands all things. He knows all things. Jesus himself, right? We know about Jesus. He was an itinerant preacher. He didn't have much. He went from place to place relying on the good graces of those who would take him in and who would provide for him, who would feed him. He said, foxes have holes, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. You remember him saying that. Yeah, he understood scarcity. He lived that way for those three years of public ministry anyway. Scarcity can produce uh, interesting results in us human beings. We start to do certain things when things are scarce. Like if we've got a few bucks, maybe we don't even trust the bank. We put it under the mattress there for safekeeping. Or when the pantry is getting empty, we lock it up lest somebody get in there and take our supplies. Or we get a bit miserly. We don't have much left, so we hang on very tight to what we do have, and we don't want to share it with anybody. Or maybe uh, we uh, just protect our stuff and and, uh, take out a loan so we can have a nice security system to keep the bad guys out of our house. Well, it all seems very logical on, on its face, these kinds of things, these sort of reactions to scarcity. 
We might say, but when my pantry's full, well, then the food bank can come right around or I'll load up a a basket full and and take it and donate it. As long as there's plenty left over in my pantry for me, I got no problem with that. Or when the bank account is flush, well, of course, then I'll be very generous with the offering or I'll really help some of those nonprofit ministries and other uh, causes that I really want to support. But, but not when things are scarce, not when I'm short uh, on cash. The Bible has much to say about wealth and abundance, certainly. Uh, one story after the other, one lesson after the other. Certainly, Jesus taught uh, more about money than he did about salvation. Did you know that on the count? Uh, uh, interesting uh, that he had plenty to say uh, about that topic. You remember what he said about two masters, you you can't serve both of them. You're going to love one and hate the other. You can't serve both God and money, Jesus said. You remember the rich young ruler came to Jesus, bowed down and said, "Uh, teacher, good teacher, what must I do to inherit salvation? And uh, the commandments, uh, how how do they read? Jesus uh, inquires, you know. Uh, and the man says, well, those commandments, yeah, love God, love my neighbor. I've kept those uh, all my life, in fact. And Jesus says, good for you. Now sell everything you have and follow me. And then what? The, this young man uh, heard that and he went away sad because he had a lot of stuff and he wasn't willing to part with his stuff. His wasn't a scarcity mentality, well, a scarcity mentality with abundance, if you will. And we who have much can also operate with this sort of scarcity mentality that I can't let loose, I can't let go of anything because I might need it, I might need it, I can't share too much of it. Well, here's the lesson for today. God uses scarcity as a doorway, really, to trust Him more. Has that ever happened in your life where you found yourself on empty? I mean, without. Lots of things, maybe. Uh, Food, provisions, uh, uh, roof over your head, strength for the day, whatever it may happen to be. For us in our lives, uh, lessons came early on for Sandy and I and our two little boys in Minneapolis. We lived there in the late 80s. We came home to Nebraska for a visit, went back home, and found things odd in our garage when the door opened. That wasn't there when we left. That looks out of place. And then the door to the house through the garage was broken in. Splinters there. We walked in, and most all of our earthly possessions were missing. We found out Uh, Actually, afterwards, as the police did their investigation while we were out, and they had no way of getting hold of us, so we just walked into the situation when we got back home. The neighbor across the street saw what had happened, uh, really, but had no idea we weren't home. She uh, uh, testified that a truck pulled into our garage. They broke in the back door of our garage, grabbed the remote, and then got in their truck, backed in, and loaded up our stuff kitchen table and chairs, coffee maker off the counter, uh, uh, phone off the wall even. I mean, everything. Everything that they could grab, they grabbed. It taught us some lessons. It was very painful to see all of that and just an eerie sensation uh, to be in your house knowing that it had been ransacked that way by these thieves. But what it taught us early on in our life together as a family is that there are things that matter a whole lot more than stuff. That stuff can be here today and gone tomorrow. Maybe you've experienced that with a fire or a flood, right? Or some other um, thing that has happened where you've lost maybe financial troubles, bankruptcy or whatever, and you just lose everything. And then it starts to resonate in, in your heart and soul about what's really important. Sandy and I have been fighting too much stuff ever since then. We just keep getting to these places, especially at our stage in life, of, will somebody come and just take this stuff? It's great having four kids. We say, here, you take our stuff. It's great to have kids. We get tired of stuff, moving it around, boxing it up. I mean, it's here today. It's gone tomorrow. How much utility is there in most of it? Yeah, we're funny creatures, us pack rats. In our story, a widow obeys, and they all eat for days. That's what happens in this story. She obeys God. She does what God wants here, even though she didn't have much. Just a handful of flour, a little oil. I mean, how far is that going to go with three mouths to feed here now? She had two. Now she's got three, a grown man to feed. When we trust in the Lord, 
This is an interesting thing. There's always enough. Maybe not abundance, but there's enough to see us through. He provides for us. You remember the children of Israel in the desert. Nothing to eat. What are we going to eat? God provides them something to eat every day. Manna, it was called. They got tired of that, grumbled about it, and God gave them meat, quail as well. You remember that. Water, what are we going to drink out here? Well, God provided water from the rock through his servant Moses. Yeah, God is a providing God, isn't he? Over and over again. Then you've got this New Testament story, a bunch of hungry mouths to feed, a multitude, in fact. The northern shore of the Sea of Galilee, there on that grassy hill, they're hungry. What are we going to do? Well, what do you have, Jesus says. And they come with the boys' lunch, five loaves, two fish. It's there in our banner as well. And then what happens? Well, a miracle happens. Everybody is fed. They, in fact, are well fed that day. But notice these supplies did not start to multiply until it was given away. Do you see that? The boy had this stuff. It wasn't starting to multiply while he was holding it. No, it only multiplied in the giving of it away. That's when it started to reproduce, if you will, itself to feed that multitude by the power of God, the intervention of Jesus there, and His power is God. Twelve baskets left over, full of bread and fish, An amazing story of God's provision. So last week I was in Belize. I wish I was there more now than then uh, because it's nice and warm in Belize, as as you know. I I, uh, did some mental health training for pastors in the north, a place called Orange Walk. And then I made my way to the western part of the country to visit my old friend, Pastor Tate. There he is. A wonderful guy. You see his tent there. This is a a tent for his ministry. Years ago, I did a seminar at his church two nights in a row. He invited his whole congregation, others from the area, and I ran a seminar under that tent, but it wasn't there. This tent's in a new place. I'll tell you about that. It used to be across the uh, street from his house, this tent, and that's where his church was because they got kicked out of their buildings uh, because there's some bad folks around. And these buildings that the church had, uh, they now lost uh, because of some people, you know, and their dealings. And uh, very unfortunate. It wasn't the church's problem, somebody outside the church. And uh, so they had the rug pulled out from under them. Just imagine if we as the people of God, uh, all of a sudden next week we tell you, well, we don't have a building anymore. Oh, where are we going to go, Right. Well, a tent maybe not so suitable uh, here in the park across the street. But in Belize, you can get by with that, right? It's about 85 every day, all day. So anyway, I was visiting with Pastor Tate uh, after I had found him because I didn't know really where to find him. I knew where his house was. I stayed there once. I talked to his wife, and she says, well, he's right around the corner. Take the first street. So I said, you mean around the bend where, where the school is? Because I remember the school. No, no, she says, we've got a new place, the first street. Okay. So I left their house, and it was just a a half a block. I took that street, and then I looked to my left, and I saw this place. Is this the place? Is this the new church? Uh, This compound, uh, fenced in? Well, I drove in the gate, and it must have uh, been. It looked like a churchy kind of place, and I asked the first person I saw, where's Pastor Tate? Oh, he's over uh, in the church. And so I go over there and chat with him in the church. Now, this tent is on their new property. This tent they folded up and walked to this new property because God gave them a new property, nine acres to use for ministry by a miraculous intervention of Almighty God. It's an amazing story, really. Now they have a room about as big as this one, 600 people coming this Sunday or next Sunday for their Thanksgiving in Belize, and they'll be feeding everybody because they got a commercial kitchen even here in this place It's an amazing facility for that place, but there's more than that, a school that can hold up to 300 secondary students, 14 to 18-year-olds. Pastor Tate is committed to training children in the way they should go, and so he's got this school they used to rent across uh, around the bend that I was talking about, and now this is their facility, can hold 300 kids. They got about 140 in there right now. And there are other things that they are providing for on this new campus. Uh, And God has been so good to them, making provision like you wouldn't believe. I mean, I I was uh, having a hard time just taking it in from a tent to all of this. What happened in a few years? 
Well, the grace of God and the provision of God happened. There's that tent again. They have it there. I said, why do you still have the tent? What are you doing under there? He said, it's there to remind us where we came from. It's there to remind us what God has done in our lives. There's his church next to that tent and this other building that they use for ministry. He and I talked about the provision of God and how it always comes down to this reality biblically that Jesus is enough. Uh, no other name. We just sang the song, right? No other name but, but Jesus. And, and we recognize this about Christ. He came to free souls, not to fill stomachs, cupboards, or bank accounts. That wasn't his primary purpose. There are some preachers that say that's why Jesus came. They're wrong. Jesus came to free us from the bondage of our sin. He came to give us eternal life. He, he came to enable us to have capacity to forgive and love others with that same love that he brought into the world through his life, through his death, through his resurrection. No more powerful words had Jesus ever spoken than these right here. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. Whoever lives and believes in me will never die, Jesus said. Well, that puts a different perspective uh, on time running out, doesn't it? <laughs> because with Jesus, time never ends. So you've got these priests in the Old Testament doing what God told them to do, sacrificing one animal right after another uh, on the altar according to God's prescription. But that was for a time. It was not enough for the sins of all of the people. No, there would be another sacrifice coming that would cover the sins of all the people. The writer of the Hebrews talks about it. But he, Jesus, appeared once for all to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Not bulls and lambs and rams on the altar anymore. Nope. No, himself, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus is enough. We recognize that. When we are hurting, when we have been hurt and we're trying to forgive, and trying to show kindness, but it's all we can muster. Jesus comes and says, forgive as I have forgiven you. Love the way that I loved you. I'll take care of your hurt. I've taken your hurt upon myself. I've experienced your hurt. I took it to the cross with me. When we're last, uh, down to our last uh, dollar, not sure uh, where our provision will come from. He says, how about you trust me? You remember the lilies of the field? the birds of the air. God cares for them. He knows all about them. How much more does he love you and care for you? You have little faith, he said. Well, we say, Lord, increase my faith, my trust in you. I appreciate what Wayne Dyer wrote. The first step toward discarding a scarcity mentality involves giving thanks for everything that you have. A scarcity mentality. We can have that in America. As much stuff as we have, we can have this sense that, oh, I just don't have enough. If only I had just this much more of whatever it is. Do you see what this uh, last big lottery did to people? Do you see what goes on? People hope, even though the odds are so astronomical, they still hope, i got to get that ticket because I might hit that big. But if you look at those stories, so many of those stories of people striking it rich one way or another, it destroys them because it's, life is not about all that stuff. It's not about all that stuff. Yeah, you can have fun for a while with it, but like Jesus said, right? Like Jesus said, you fool, this night all this stuff will be required of you. Now what's going to happen? Your soul is coming to me. Now what's going to happen with all your stuff? The first step toward discarding a scarcity mentality involves giving thanks for everything. You know that that's the first step toward dealing with depression and anxiety? This from secular writers, believe it or not, who don't even understand, perhaps, where everything comes from. But to be thankful for what we do have, that's a step in the right direction, dealing with our heart, our soul, our mind, our troubles. The thief, Jesus said, John 10, does not come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I've come that they may have life. They may have it more abundantly. Yeah, Jesus has abundance for us, but it's not about stuff. It's about his love. It's about his grace. It's about the peace that passes all understanding. It's about his mercy. 
Uh, It's about his eternal life that he provides us because he conquered death and the grave. This is an amazing story, this woman. We don't even know her name. We don't know her son's name. The, The widow at Zarephath, she has been known for all of these centuries. But she learned some things when the prophet of God showed up at her place. She learned that you can't outgive God, that God will provide, and sometimes, in this case, especially miraculously. And the miracles weren't over. Remember that son of hers, he died. She blamed Elijah. Elijah blamed God, and then God says, how about we raise him from the dead, which God did. That's the power that God has to raise people even from the dead. And that's what we declare in the creed as well. We believe in the resurrection of the body, the life everlasting. God does have that power. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this amazing account. Uh, A widow, one person, and and her son, uh, uh, yet we're still talking about her all these centuries later. There's much for us here in this story. And Lord, in our scarcity mentality, when we think we don't have enough, remind us that in you, Jesus, we have more than enough. In your precious name we pray. Amen.